to start this brainstorming process and so we start you know, at the beginning we have different views different opinion we still have actually <laughs> but, we <laughs> but we ended up with uh, a model this model has two different um, two different souls it's a model where the entrepreneurial spirit meets social responsibility where the, a learning process means a networking platform. So, and most 
of all, this model wants to be a challenge made run by students and for students. So we started with this idea that is called the Confession Lab. And uh, after the idea, what we learned here at school, you have to test it, your idea. So from the idea, we start to the execution. We started with the best way to uh, measure our experiment are some numbers. We start with 18 teams from different backgrounds, from different courts. More than 80 people are in this, uh, started this journey, this program. And we organize some events and more than 100 people participated doing in just three months, four months, no more than that. And here are some other numbers. We started with two clubs, but we bought other clubs. We have 20 mentors, most of them are here, and uh, I want to thank you for supporting our teams, our project. Uh, also 10 speakers that attend our learning workshops, from design thinking to pitching technique, metrics, and marketing communication. And uh, we are building also a network of bunch of partners. We have uh, already uh, KivaZip as a partner. We are collaborating with the, uh, also with the Hard Prize and uh, with an incubator called Creation uh, Up in Nigeria. And we are working on creating this network <laughs> that can leverage our activities. This is our teams in our school. We have any kind of idea from different industries, as you can see, from my tech to food and beverage, e-commerce, art and design. And the amazing thing is the involvement of the art community. We were able to involve all the uh, different masters that uh, we have here. Of course, the MSC, I'm proud of that. Uh, we are all uh, so excited to share that every court was involved uh, and uh, some entrepreneurial spirit that uh, joined our journey. So um, since we are, uh, before yeah, going to the uh, into the details of this, of the final thing, I would like to ask uh, Larry, that is the Dean of our school, to have a, uh, <coughs> say hi to our, <laughs> our activities. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one, of, one of the complicated things about HALT is that every 12 months we regenerate ourselves. And so um, sometimes that leads to some problems where you know you, you have a good group and then the next year doesn't become a good group and, and all that. But this particular year, I was really proud of what you guys have accomplished because seemingly two very different groups got together. You know, the for-profit, not-for-profit not group and you kind of came together because many of the things we're, we're learning is that business is applicable to every organization, whether it's a for-profit startup or a large major multinational or a, uh, an NGO, a foundation, a government. Uh, what we learn should be applied to make our organization successful. So the same rigor that we would look put to if we we're going to launch a new semiconductor, a new, uh, new uh, social uh, digital marketing app is the same kind of rigor we should subject our social business to. It should make sense to everybody involved. Um, and so I'm, I'm really pleased with what you guys have done together. And um, I'm very much looking forward to what we're about to see. So thanks, thanks for all the hard work. Thank you. So before uh, passing yeah, uh, to Rachel, um, I just want to uh, first start to thank you, all the people that uh, make this all this happen. So I want to thank you, Rachel, Natalia, Jose, Matteo, Dario, uh, Enrico, Diana, Hilda, Link, Mo, <laughs> all the people that uh, contributed to this experiment. Thank you. Prana, there is outside. Sorry, I'm, I can't I see my Raise your hands. Thank you.
So to just give you an overview of what's going to happen, um, this slide is approximately true, but like with any startup, there's changes. <laughs> um, so we have now, so there'll be all the teams, there'll be five minutes of presenting, and that will go straight into five minutes of Q&A. Now the Q&A are technically open to anyone, but the judges should have priority. So each team, five minutes presenting, five minutes of Q&A. And then after that, we have 10 minutes of break, and this is when I will take the judges um, through to have their deliberations. Um, and following the 10 minutes, there's actually going to be another opportunity for the three <coughs> highest scoring teams to then come back, and then they'll get announced individually and come up and have five more minutes of Q&A for anything, um, any final questions before a final decision for the judges. And then, as we'll, dis as we'll discover in the next slide, this is part of a process. So this is obviously one of the biggest parts, so it's going to be 35% of deciding who's the winner. But there's been a whole journey that all of you teams have gone through. And so as so all the other bits that you've done, so all the submissions, um, the feedback from mentors, all of that is being taken into account. So the winner of the whole thing will be based on the whole process. So, That's okay, unexpected. I will just um, do a little bit about living. Um, Sorry, guys. Uh, the scores so far, anyone could technically win. The, uh, the minimum score is 30, the maximum score is 59. So if you remember, 35% is on this. So if you ace. Um, this presentation, then you can still win the whole thing. Um, and the winners will be announced in the cocktails afterwards because we have to do the calculations. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to find out who wins... After the cocktail or the cocktail? <laughs> <laughs> ah, let's see, let's see. Um, and so what does the winner, winning team win? Well, as you should all know, and I hope you've all participated in, there's been a... Um, a bit of a crowdsourcing, and we've managed to raise 1,185 so far for the winning team. Now, if you notice the time here, yeah. it's still what eight hours left. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if, like, when you now you could probably still be um, pitching in. You might still win, so it might kind of publicise for all your friends. And then, obviously, as the winning team, you'll still have a few hours after you know that you've won <coughs> to get that as much as high as possible. So now we can start. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. <laughs> and I mean, let's let's start with our pitching competition, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, but before, the, of course, start with the uh, war pitching. A special thanks to all the judges that are here and they're gonna. I mean. Uh, select and evaluate our project and contribute to the uh, to the winning team. Thank you once again. <laughs> and our first team is the stick. Unfortunately, this is not a working model, but imagine this this is a piano that I get to play, and then with a push of a button, I get to change the f visual format into like a guitar. Okay, I wish I could play the guitar, but I can't play the guitar, which is why I created the stick. Okay, so let me give a quick description of what we're talking about here. Sorry about the 
thing. It's going to be 25 inches uh, long. This thing is uh, 35 inches long. People recommended they're shorter, so I'm going to make it a little bit shorter. 25 inches long, 4 inches wide at one end, 2 inches wide on the other end. Okay, forget about all the technical stuff. That's not that important. All right, so what's going to look like is that it can change from one interface to a different interface over time. Well, not, it doesn't change over time. You have to push a button or something like that to make that happen because you don't want to suddenly have to play a guitar while in the middle of a piano kind of thing. So, but the, uh, this is what the stick can do. And the more important thing is that you can add additional instruments over time. Okay, what's the market? The market is, I'm estimating about 100 million people. Where did I get that number? I didn't just pull it out of my butt. Um, actually, think about iPods. Okay, how many iPods are out there? Okay, there's about 100 million, 200 million or so. Okay, everybody who has an iPod, they want music. This is the music that they can also make as well. So that's how I'm estimating that, okay? But you can also see that the number of piano players in the US is about 21 million around the whole world. Probably about five times that, one, that many. So we're, we're looking at, you know, about 100 million people who are interested in wanting to play an instrument. Now, some of you guys, I've talked to you guys, and you say, well, I don't like this kind of feel. I like the real feel. But, you know, when you learn something, you learn something, and once you get used to it, you get used to it. So don't worry about it. So um, that, that's really the basic idea. Um, the pricing, it's $200. Okay, where did I get that? Well, an iPad, which has pr practically the same amount of technology inside it, is about $199, $200 so uh, for the low end. Here, we don't have to worry about memory and a whole bunch of other items. Okay, so 199 seems like a good competitive price because also, if you go to like the guitar center here on Van Ness, a decent, uh, decent guitar there is about 150 at the low end to about 500 on the middle end to about 1,000 or so on the high end. So 199 is a very good competitive price to it. Okay, and then we can also make fancier ones, and maybe the, uh, the, the, the surface of this thing is actually made out of wood. Okay, or you can be made out of other kind of material that you can make it so that it would be more appreciative for the user. Okay, what is the value proposition of this device? One, it has a good UI, all right? Convenience, you can play piano, you can play guitar, you can play any kind of instrument that you can create for it, all right? You have auto-tune, this is good, so that's people like me who can't play anything, at least it'll sound correct. Okay, so, to some degree. Uh, we can also upload new sounds, that means new type of music, new type of sounds. You can create your own instrument, literally create your own instrument. And then you can also sell this. We're going to create a marketplace for this so you can sell your instrument. Okay, you create, there'll be a template, an API of sorts that you can create the instrument, you can sell this, people buy it, they get royalty, you get royalty, and people use it. Wouldn't that be cool? Okay, all right. So right now what the status is, we got the non-functional prototypes created, as I showed you here, all right. Uh, we're gonna, I got the spec out for the functional one. I have a friend, he's an industrial designer. I showed him this and he gave me some uh, numbers for that. It's about 120,000 for the whole, for creating a prototype with all the bells and whistles. I'm expecting to kind of like parse that out into several steps so that it's not, I don't want to build a whole $120,000 worth of prototype. I'm going to build out the, like a basic version and then a more advanced version and go on from that and use Indiegogo to go from one step to the next, okay? Because then you can ask for 20,000, it's a little easier to do, all right? Here are some of the numbers, uh, we can skip this part. Uh, projections, well, hopefully we'll go up to about two and a half million or so in about two years, okay? Uh, this the team, I'm Eric, uh, I don't see Jing Jing, I think it was upstairs. She's not here, I mean it's not here. Matt is our um, mentor and I don't think he's here. And Dan, he's a friend of mine, he's the industrial designer that uh, helped create this, uh, did, did the specking out. Okay, any questions? Describe your target um, audience. Who's, who's the customer for this? Um, I would say people in their early 20s, primarily. Uh, it could be also teenagers and kids who like it, who want to you know, learn how to play. We can also work with schools so that they can create, buy 100 of these and instead of having pianos and guitars and violins and drums and all that. They can have one, you know, same of these things so that if one breaks, you know, you just push a button and it becomes the other one. And how, how would you go to market with this? Uh, it would be sold online at first. 
uh, we're, we're hoping that the, the idea is to go on Indiegogo first to really prove the concept whether it's going to work or not by having people, you know, do crowdfunding. If it doesn't crowdfund, then it ain't going to go beyond the step, in other words. Okay, but if we do get crowdfunding for it and there's a big interest, uh, then you definitely will go push to the next step and then uh, get it out there. And that will have validation of, uh, of you know, consumer interest. There's a video game uh, manufacturer like the, the Rock Band and things like that. Have you looked at those as competitors? Or? Uh, actually, there is a number of competitors. The main thing that I see about competitors is that they really want to recreate a, an, an instrument. Okay, And uh, there, there are several that are using uh, various technologies for the iOS. Um, but they really want to recreate it as opposed to breaking that paradigm and just allowing the usefulness of, of a, a virtual, you know, haptic touch. So I, I'm just putting a, a piano image here because otherwise you may not get the idea of what I have in mind. But ultimately, this is not going to use the piano constantly. Whatever is the most comfortable using this, and maybe you wave your hand like this, you move the, th you move the device, however you want to make it move to to enable the sound to come out. Okay. You can't, for example, the, the problem with the piano is that when you play a note, it's a note. You can't do vibrato on a piano, okay? Or maybe on a synthesizer you can't. But here, you know, you can go like this and you may be able to do vibrato. Um, you can, you know, play a note and it can drone on and then you can do something else. Uh, the, so the technology allows for a much more vibrant, much more uh, uh, interesting sounds that you can create that you physically cannot create with real, real physical, well, I don't want to say real, but, you know, with the mechanical instruments, okay? So we want to really push that limit push that you know beyond what what sense yes uh, you have a mention about the software component the software component yes. and not just the software component the device but the software that you need to support the device mm -hmm. uh, maybe to learn to play an instrument maybe to look yes. at the different songs or maybe you can have the background music when you play. Exactly, so you can do that. Tell us about that. Yes, about that. Uh, well, there will be some parts of it where uh, you will be able to, just say, you can play the tempo, right? I mean, I think like, that's pretty standard in most uh, synthesizers. You can set up a little, like a drum tempo, and then you can start playing on top of that. So instead of a metronome, you have something a little bit better than that. Uh, the things is that you will be able to record and actually write, print out the score of what you play. So you might play, you know, ding, 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 whatever, it'll record that and I can, you know, put that as a score and I can sell that in the marketplace, okay? Um, another thing that you can do is I would have auto-tune so that if you play the wrong notes, it doesn't play the wrong note, okay? Another thing that this, this could be good is that this, the keys can be shrunken down so that if you're a small kid, okay, now you can play octaves that you couldn't possibly do on a real keyboard. Okay, you know, I, I can't span that far, but if this is shrunk down by 60% or so, then I can. Okay, and imagine you playing that for, uh, you know, shrink that down and playing it as an adult hand, where you can play two octaves, and okay? that's pretty cool. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Or? Yes, I, my, my thought, is, or my concern is that the amount of software development, whether it can be biased. Uh, well, I, I think it can, because what we're, Dedicating it to, in terms of the, the the CPU, will be just on these kind of software, on, on just powering it to, to manage the. No, I mean, basically yes. the cost. The development oh, okay. Cost. The development cost will be pretty high, I think. Um, mm -hmm. There, uh, I, I have uh, talked about it, and uh, the primary one is that the first step is actually to get the drivers to actually, because this is a not non rectangular shape. There's a little bit of technology involved, and you'd be able to print out uh, to to identify what the pixels are on, on this thing. So that's a little bit different than your standard rectangular shaped object. And there, there is going to be some technology um, in order to make that happen. It's doable, but it could be difficult. We have time for I have a follow-up question, Carlos, is if you don't mind. I'm thinking this is a computer, and I was wondering, is it is it self-contained so the music comes out of this, or is it a front end to a computer that actually plays? No, you plug it in, it goes to a speaker or something. Okay. So I'm really interested in the gross margin for this because it sounds like there's very expensive components. There's the, there's the touch. Well, it'll be smaller, so don't th I think surface area would probably be the same to like a like an iPad. Right. Okay. An iPad is 199 or something like that. Okay. It's making decent gross margins. But then you need batteries. You need yes. uh, SSD. But you don't need like you don't need as much uh, memory, and you don't need a whole bunch of extra whatever graphics and all that. I mean, this is. 
this is a non, not high graphics intensive. Okay. 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 So, so what I'm going after is the price and the margin. What? How much margin have you cut for the? For the uh, well, I did mention that here. I, yeah, uh, I, I, I kind of glossed over quickly. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at you know the, the bill of materials for the things to be about uh, close to 100 at first. Okay. So we're only making about nine, 89 dollars per unit. Okay. Um, so I guess that's gross. Uh, it probably, I, I, I haven't fully specced it out. I mean, part, part of the thing is that me being an individual manufacturer of this thing, I'm not going to get the cheap discounts that Apple's will. So my, my, where I was going with this is, are you selling it retail or wholesale? If you're selling it retail, retail. Retail online and going to, uh, going to music stores and selling it there. No, so we, that, that's actually wholesale, I guess. I'm sorry, we have to end the discussion. I think we can continue during the, the okay, break. Sorry. So, thank you very thank much. Now we have kitchen maids, and I'm going to ask to feedback to get, get ready for the next speech. Thank you. based on the quality of their food. You might be asking yourself, who are these bakers? We've actually bucketed our bakers into three particular categories. Culinary students is first. Now these are individuals that we can actually provide them an opportunity for practical training, as well as we can give them the opportunity to earn some money while they're in school. Secondly is our semi-pros. You'd be surprised how many individuals are out there that currently have Facebook sites who actually are selling to their local communities. But what we can provide them with kitchen maids is access to new customers, 
as well as providing the ease with online payments. And thirdly is our hidden home heroes. These are individuals who receive rave reviews from the people in their, in their households as well as their friends. And what we can provide them is instant online presence as well as a no hassle free delivery system. Now I'm going to be passing it to Steve to tell us how big this marketplace is and how we can take a bite. Thank you. So one of the big questions we've been asked is, well, really, how big is this industry? And in, well, in the US, it's a $33 billion industry. That's bed, bread and baking. And we want to take a slice out of this. So we'll look at the revenue model. Our cravers will go online, will make a purchase through us, and we will transfer the money to the bakers. The bakers will then deliver their uh, baked goods to our central hub, and we will distribute the delivery back to the cravers. And how do we make money? And that's off a 10% transaction fee on each order. And looking at scale, in the first year, we're going to focus on San Francisco. Uh, we're going to look to get 50 bakers, and that's based off of looking at the number of culinary students in the city, which is about 450 per term, and there's three terms per year. We're also looking at the, the number of people who have shown interest in our, in our surveys to join the platform, and uh, we're, we're going to base off that. And looking at the revenues, this is based off of the number of times people are looking to buy baked goods and the average cost from our surveys. In year two, we're looking to expand. We're looking to go to Los Angeles and to Portland. Why these cities? The first reason is because there's cottage food acts in these states where people are legally allowed to sell online. <coughs> and uh, they can sell up to $50,000 a year. And we'll expand our number of bakers as well as our revenues. And I'll pass it back to David to look at how we're going to go. All right, now how do we come up with these assumptions? We just didn't clearly make them up. We actually did some digging, and in our surveys, we found up some interesting stats. One of them being is that 75% of bakers actually want to conduct and participate in online selling. Secondly, 61% of our cravers are willing to buy online. Now, in terms of what they want to buy, here are the four key items in which we discovered. It was cookies, cupcakes, brownies, and cakes. They have interest from the baker side, as well as the, the craver side. And eight out of 10 of our bakers would love, would love a delivery service. Now, we didn't only find information here, but this was an also an amazing opportunity to connect with interested bakers, which actually enabled us to start our MVP. We've already started creating a beta website, as well as we have a group of interested bakers who are willing to participate. And we've actually honed in in our, in our local areas. All right, and here's just a few of our big, uh, interested bakers who are willing to proceed and along with our team. Now, I'm sure you've heard who we are and you've heard our concept, and I'm sure you've baked up some really great ideas. So we'd love to hear that. What is the regulatory environment about the health considerations? Mm -hmm. So, and so that, that comes to, there's, there's a thing called the Cottage Food Act, and it's, it's different in different states. Um, so now there's, in California and in Oregon, people are allowed to sell uh, online, um, as well as at farmer's markets and that. And they just have to take uh, uh, an online test. So it, I believe that the cost in California is $130. Um, and in Oregon, I believe it was $150. And the good part about this is that it's actually growing. So we can see a trend happening where there's a desire for people to, to buy food from, from local homes, as well as to sell. Do you have an idea of the, the delivery economics and what the average transaction would have to be for you guys to make money on those four types of items? So, so for delivery, we wanted to model it after a number of the, the, the different food sharing sites are out there, like Spray and Montreal. They, they all deliver from the central hub, which is why we chose the our, we think our bakers which should be bringing the items to us and we'll distribute from there. Um, in, in our economics, we actually are accounting for for two dollars per delivery, uh, on top of the normal uh, per item fee, so it, which is in line with the the competitors right now. So you, you guys make two dollars a delivery. So we, 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 charge, we, we charge two dollars for delivery. Right. We believe delivery will be a wash, so we will not <coughs> be making money or break even. Adding to that. Um, uh, for example, in this platform, usually uh, we were expecting uh, people is going to purchase from their neighbors, from their uh, people who is close to their communities. Uh, 
that's our assumption and that's what we wanted to try and to test in our MVP. So, um, I'm Paul. I love cookies and all the things you sell. But, so you're selling small quantities to me. Have you thought of selling to people that may have small cafes or restaurants that, that may be good at savory items but aren't particularly good at making desserts? There's some very bad desserts and kind of moderate to low quality uh, priced uh, restaurants. Have you thought of the distribution channel for different market segment on the customer side? Or are you sticking to all? No, completely. We, we thought about it. Uh, and then it's completely in our focus in the next uh, step. But what we are doing right now is trying to validate this model with the local community, for example, host students. Uh, and see if there's supply and demand. Uh, because we are wondering about how it's going to be the supply for local restaurants. So what we want to ensure is the supply. And actually to add to that, there's for, for re regulatory, uh, in California, if that is allowed, it's not allowed in every state. So it's a different regulation to be able to sell um, through, through a third party. Uh, like, so this like cottage, uh, the cottage, the cottage food yeah. only is for peer to peer, basically. Exactly. Not yeah. through. Uh, or farmers market, but in this case, okay. uh, yeah, no, and you you can in California, you can, but it, they need an additional regulation and a an once year audit to be able to sell through a third party. Okay. Uh, could you refresh me a little bit on what such a quality control of the product? Yeah, is it? Well, I think the most important thing with this is actually the rating system, right? When a peer -to -peer, in a peer-to-peer -peer market, it's extremely important that our cravers are well aware of who our high-quality bakers are and that they do rate. And we find a lot of sound um, examples of that, whether it be Uber or in a lot of these marketplaces, as well as um, that food app really does help us in terms of you know how they're able to sell uh, within their local communities. So going back to kind of the Uber Lyft model, uh, in order to become part of the network, you're now screening process to make sure it's a certain standard as well as it's communicating to the culture. And we're sharing their stories as well too. So as a craver, you're going to be able to see kind of what their background is, but if they're a culinary student or if they're a home here. And just to give you a question, to be able to sell from home, you need a couple certificates that are recovered for that because you need to sell from home. So as they get the, the license and the certificate, the health certificate, then they will be able to start selling. Um, I think that one of the weaknesses of your model is that you're going to take possession of the bake rules. Uh, have you thought the possibility that the, the shipment doesn't take doesn't go through your hands, that it yes. goes directly from the baker to the craver? This is a great debate that exactly. we've been having. <laughs> um, and I think that we're, why we landed on why we wanted to take care of deliveries, we actually looked at a lot of primary companies right now. And by taking care of delivery, we really own that process. If indeed we were just creating a platform where bakers and cravers could connect, there could be risk there that the bakers don't show on time and the whole experience is not on So we wanted to manage the whole customer experience from the, the website to the actual delivery. So the centralization of the hub is part of quality control. Yes. Okay. Okay. Last question. question. Can I ask a question? Can I make a statement? Sure. I think there's one thing I noticed to your transaction 10%. In my opinion, this is not exactly accurate what's going on. You've got 10% as a transaction, but really you're a market maker. You're doing marketing. I would see that as more like 25%. I think your margins are too low. You should ask for more. You're the market man, right? <laughs> Boost your margins. So. <laughs> 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 Now we have feedback, and I'm going to ask to take a minute to get ready for the next bit.
another morning and looks at the timer and is just like, is this ever going to end because I want to get out of here. It's so hard to concentrate. You're in the gym and you just, you want to be fit and you love exercise. For someone like me, I've been running for almost all my life. Um, I used to run relays when I was really little, so it's, it's a passionate sport for me. And so I find myself in the gym every other day just running around. And um, like me, most people do this. Even if it's not running, you like some kind of sports. It could be tennis, it could be something else. And then you find out that you're the only one amongst your friends who is passionate about this sport. You're fr trying to get yourself you know, active, but at the same time, you cannot do it alone. And that's where I found my dilemma. And you know, talking to my friends, especially on the whole campus, I realized this is really what everyone is kind of going through. And so, that's when FitBud came into reality. And we thought about it and we were like, what, wouldn't it be great to find an app that could connect you to the person down the street, the person next door that you've never spoken to, but is passionate about the same sport that you are in. So if it's vo volleyball, like my um, neighbor, it's cricket. And um, you can just find someone in the neighborhood that's just going to connect you. And you guys can go around and play the same sport. And so not only does this um, connect you to someone in your neighborhood who can play the same sport, it's such a, a, a kind of a social event as well. Because then you get to find people with like-minded interests who are active. And then it, it, it's like a social, a little social club that you find. <laughs> and so we took a little consensus in um, um, San Francisco and we found out that 78% of San Francisco, San Franciscans play a certain kind of sport and are active three to five times a week, a day, per week. And so we thought this is a very huge market that we would like to start up. <coughs> so um, how many of you know Spots, the Spots app? One person. Exactly. So Spots app is our, is our main rival. And what they do is they connect you with people in your neighborhood who play like-minded sports. But the thing is, nobody knows it. In this whole room, just one person knows what's up. And so that's the key dilemma, is that why were they failing when um, this is such a great idea and we thought about it ourselves. And we came across the, the fact <coughs> that um, Spots app doesn't really connect you to people effectively. You go on the, the, the interface, it's a little app, and then you just find that they suggest a million spots. I mean, we came across things that we've never even known were sports before. And so we thought, this is not effective because it doesn't really speak to the people. You need to connect with people with their passions before you are able to sell to them. And as you know, people who wear um, the little, uh, what is it called? Fitbit. Fitbit and uh, yeah, the little bracelets which track your activities. Oh, you've got one. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, um, it's, it's good for individual people because that's also, so people just like doing sports on their own. But also, um, people who do this are get less motivated. Not everyone, but people, you get less motivated. If the first week you're like, oh, this is great. I'm going to go check my laptop and see how I'm doing. But two weeks in, you're like, you're like this is so important. I want someone who's going to challenge me. And that's what the sports is about. So moving on. And so how it works for Fitbit. First, you set up a profile, and then you choose your preferences. You, we match you with people who we think are in your area and who are like-minded in the same sport. And then you set up an activity with them by sending them a message. You get great deals from restaurants around, healthy restaurants, which are just around your area, and also good deals from places like GNC, which provides sporting supplements. And this is Chad, and this is a profile, sorry, that we made. And he got five stars because he's such a great partner to, to, to participate in a sports with. And that's why you get ratings on your profile. And if you like the person, we can match you up. And if you don't, and then we look for someone who is more akin to you. It's a 360 experience. You have your sporting activity and a social experience. So it creates a kind of hub around the social climate in, the, in San Francisco, which is a big thing. So we believe that Fitbit can be a big success because it's a great way to build friendships around a great interesting activity like sports. Thank you. You mentioned the failure of your main competitor to yeah. gain any, any traction. How would you, um, how would you launch it and start building that kind of viral connection? What would you do to get your users? Okay, so the main thing that we thought when we went on the app was that um, 
it doesn't really connect you to people. When you first log in, it just asks you what kind of sports you're interested in. For someone like me, I don't really know what kind of sports I'm interested in until I try it. So I didn't know I really liked cricket because I thought it was really boring until I tried it with a man. So we first want to know who you are. What our app will ask you first is your profile, what you're interested in, where you are. And then we, we link you up with people in your area who we think would be a great match to you. And then you can start the conversation. What are you into? Oh, we're going for swimming in on Saturday. Are you interested? Me and two friends are going. And then you start the communication. And that's how we think we'll be able to You, you just them. described um, what you would do once you get them. But, I'm, you know, but right now you have zero, presumably, yeah. people. So you need to get this critical mass of people that have varying interests. Yeah. How do you get them into the phone? So another aspect of, of the app will be to give people discounts <coughs> in the gym in the area and also deals on restaurants as well. So as we know, a lot of people follow things like Wuhan and, and stuff like that. So that's also a key area that we thought, you know, if you join our app, you can get free, you can get deals on things in your local vicinity. And mostly people we like to target people who are not really native to San Francisco because like most of us in Halt, you might be living here for years and you know things in your area, but when you first come into a city, you want to, if you're an active person, you don't want to just sign up for the next $90 gym down the street because that's the only one you've seen on your way. You know, so you can actually interact and get on the app, get good deals in the area. Is there a revenue model and do you want money from us? No. no. There's no revenue model? No. Okay. Oh. <laughs> and you don't want money? No, we just... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Those are going to go well. <laughs> no, I thought you meant... <laughs> I thought you, but the app will be free. That's what I thought you meant. If we, you have to pay for the app. But yeah, we, we put in the... We factored in the cost of making... Of constructing an app, which would be $30,500 to make an app like this. And we will have to pay Apple as well if we're launching it on Apple, which is $90 a year. Right. Uh, 99 I think, a year. And we will have to give them 30% of each sale that we make, which would be known mostly by the deals that we make with the um, advertising for the restaurants, <coughs> the healthy restaurants in GNC if they want to come. So this feels really similar to uh, maybe a more focused version of Meetup. It yeah. seems like Meetup is perhaps what is capturing this use case today. Yeah. Uh, does Meetup perhaps have an API that you can plug into and maybe collect some sports and then begin to see and use that as marketing? Yeah, we actually did. We did try that. Um, we thought of that as well, but um, we just wanted to be more independent, I think. But I'll put it that way. Yeah. Um, so I guess that would probably be what I would want to see is how is this is going to be 10 times better than that same activity. I think the key issue, the key um, aspect here is focus. I mean, um, the problem with most of these sites, I think, when you go on them, is you get overwhelmed. You know, if you scroll down like 10 times, and you just see, keep seeing things, you know, you're not really sure what's going on there. So I think because we're streamlined and we're focused on what we're doing and what we're giving to the customer, I think in the same thing, do you connect to Facebook and then keep your friends there and do yeah. pop with them? Yeah. yeah. Just start them. I think that's the biggest challenge is getting that critical mass yeah. of people. Yeah. Um, exactly. You have a lot of ideas what you do once they get to know how good yeah. your site is and yeah. your programs and your discounts, but getting that critical yeah. mass yeah. is yeah. always tough. Well, yeah, it's the, um, you'd be, when you log in, you'd be logging in through your social media, so Facebook. Yeah. So what's your exit plan? 
we were thinking of that, but for now, like you said, like I said, it's the biggest challenge is um, how we create awareness. So that's what we're focused on now. How do we get the mass amount of people to get on that? And then if we feel like um, this is too big to handle and we just want to cash out, then we think, yeah. Well, how are you going to cash out? That's the question. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I think um, like Angry Bird and all these um, apps which amass a huge amount of money, like Angry Bird alone has 50 million and masses 50 million per apple. So um, first think about how are you going to get that revenue if it's going to be successful. Thanks, Peter. And now we have Debbie Amen. And I'm going to ask somebody one to be.
Okay, so since we are running a little bit late, even due to this kind of you know, yeah. change and uh, unforeseen events, I'm going to ask you to be very punctual street and even the judges in the making the pre question and pre sponsor. All right? Good. Thanks. Hello, my name is Omar. I'm really excited to be here. And I'm here to talk about a problem that we do not necessarily all experience, but we can all relate to. Everyone here in here is an entrepreneur. We all know the necessity of time. We all have a list of tasks we want to do in the morning. Now imagine a chronic patient. He has double that amount of, of, of tasks and double the stress. So this is at the core of what Tibia Med is. We basically want to improve the chronic patient's quality of life by using simple uh, texting, SMS, and giving them data insights. Now, as a physician, I've seen patients try to uh, work through all the tasks, the maze of tasks that they have to do. And because they have to do so much, the result is they don't stick to the treatment. Now, is it a problem? It's a big problem. And um, the costs speak for themselves. Now, it costs the, the US system alone around $290 billion just because patients don't stick to their treatment and because of the readmissions. Diabetes alone is responsible for 90% of uh, this problem. And it doesn't just stop in the United States. This is a heat map of what's going on with diabetes around the world and pr uh, with projections until 2025. Look at the Middle East, look at Brazil, look at Mexico. It's a big problem. And this is where our solution really stands out. Because it's SMS, it's accessible to everyone all around the world. Now, unlike our competitors, all, all, all they currently have now is uh, things that require other devices. They require uh, smartphones, which is not as accessible as TrackMe. Now we have a functional product. We have 25 users using this product and giving us constant feedback and we're changing it. They send simple SMS and we give them all these insights. If you go to trackme.net, you can sign up now. Now this means a lot to everyone in the uh, all healthcare players. The doctor can pinpoint their, their patients, whoever they need. The patients can get reminders to stick to their treatments and their caregivers can follow up with them no matter where they are. Now, this is what it costs hospitals. Hospitals, for every patient that gets readmitted within 30 days, it costs hospitals up to $5 billion. And insurance companies afterwards, because of uh, the non adherence cost them up, uh, up to $1.3 billion. And that's just talking about diabetes, not other chronic diseases. We plan to get 1,000 users or 1,000 patients in the first year, potentially saving our clients $1 million worth of penalties because of Obamacare. And we uh, intend to uh, we price it as 10% of what we're saving them, so we're giving 100,000. Uh, our target market is 45 to 60 uh, years old diabetic patients, and we have a multi-sided business with several revenue models from the hospitals, from insurance, thereby giving patients this service for free. Now, our team is a multi-dynamic and very global team. That's why we're focused on, we're really excited on taking the solution uh, outside the United States. Atha uh, is, the, is the president of the company. He started three businesses before, and we're already focused on the simplicity of uh, how chronic diseases should not affect the quality of life. And that's what we surround basically all our products uh, around it. TrackMe, uh, we've done a crowdfunding campaign, it's still going, you can check it on trackme.net again. And we've done several uh, other products, and we've, through, through all these uh, competitions and events here at HALT, we've been able to uh, engage and communicate with uh, plenty of major players in the industry, and we're constantly engaging them uh, and moving forward. Our roadmap is simply to start with diabetics, using that as our niche uh, in California and Massachusetts, then extending them to other chronic diseases, solutions which we're already working on and have functional prototypes for, uh, moving out to the United States, going global, and essentially at the end, we see this company in three to five years as a data analytics company, and that's where it gets interesting. The more patients we're getting, the more we can analyze this data, and uh, the more insights we can actually give to these patients. Now, finally, um, every business has have the access strategy and that's what we have our eye on. Um, we are either willing to um, uh, at the end get acquired of one of the major players such as Sutter Health who we've started actually engaging in a conversation with through uh, the career day and um, we have a meeting with them next month and um, Kaiser Permanente or all these kind of insurance companies or if we start getting a uh, an actual uh, global outreach and start having this big impact over the, over the globe we can uh, go for an IPO option, which will be another exit. Thank you, and uh, if you just go to our website, you can see all this, and uh, you, our crowdfunding campaign is still going, so you can still engage if uh, you like it. And, but more importantly, our prototype is right there. It's functional, it's working. <coughs> if you guys know any diabetic or are diabetics yourselves, you can try it out, let us know what you think, and um, we'd love to hear from you. That's what we're about. Thank you.
So uh, you went through some details uh, a little fast for me. So if if I'm I, if I'm afflicted uh, with chronic diabetes, what do I do? Is it does it poke me and get blood from me? Does it? Uh, we can walk through these. Okay. So yeah, just tell me how uh, how the actual patient uh, relates reacts to the system. So basically how this works is uh, the patient gets a reminder every day telling him, hey, what's your, what's your glucose level? What's your hemoglobin you see level? And the patient would simply just send a text. They're already, they're already doing that with their glucometers. So they send, let's say, a number 140. And then they would log in to this web portal and it would show them an actual graph in real time. Uh, they can give access to other people, such as their physician or their family members. And uh, it gives them insights later on, on where you are, uh, trends over three days, and we're working on more features as more people use it and start giving us uh, feeds so, so it's kind of a high, high tech, kind of a nice nagging, right? Because I know I'm supposed to take my meds if I'm chronic. I know I should take my blood glucose level uh, in, in the morning, um, and it nags me. Hey, Larry, have you done that, right? So that, so, That's and then I report it through the SMS, and then it keeps the database for me and my physician. Okay, I got well, it. Nagging is one of them. Yeah, but <laughs> it's a word, but to me, it's, it works, so I figured out. One of the major yeah. problems we discovered with diabetic patients are a lot of patients with chronic diseases and an adherence. Adherence is a huge issue. Right. So we've created a solution that puts like your prescription reminders, um, you to take your glucose, and um, any kind of dietary restrictions all in one place. And then, yeah, and then the nagging comes up where we send reminders and stuff. But really, it's, uh, it's our sustainability component of it, where we're educating the patient or educate a patient to go on to check their trends to see how they're doing. And um, we want to build a place where they can see their trends and then their doctor or their care or their loved ones and caregivers can also log into the portal and see. So it's actually connecting everything as well. Yeah, thank you. Do you have a slide with an income statement on it? Well, we don't have a slide with an income statement. Uh, we don't have a financial stock here in the PowerPoint, but we do have uh, our market size and our uh, uh, revenue. So how, how do you make money? Just right there. So basically, we are um, the, the main idea here is about the potential savings for the hospitals, right? So they uh, through Obamacare, they 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 can pay anywhere from twenty thousand to two hundred fifty thousand per patient that gets readmitted. Now we believe our our solutions will help these patients outside the hospital, and so we if we get one thousand patients, we can be making be saving these hospitals potentially one million dollars. So we're pricing it at ten percent of what we're saving. But, is there a mechanism to kind of quantify and charge somebody for for money they didn't have to spend? You're actually charging savings, right? So how yeah. is there a mechanism to do that? To, to actually write, write an invoice to an uh, insurance company, or Obamacare, or a hospital for 10 percent of things they didn't have to pay? Well, it's 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 basically a contract based, and what we're telling them is. Um, so 20% of our target market usually get paid. That's a okay. statistic. So we are telling them, all right, you're usually you're used to getting the, this amount of patients uh, readmitted. So we start signing up for your patients. We'll decrease that number, and then we'll pay for whatever they didn't, uh, or we we'll charge them for whatever they, they they didn't have to pay. Basically. So whatever we save them. So it's 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 basically something that every hospital is, is currently trying to put into its strategy because with Affordable Care Act, it's even going uh, further up. So everyone's really trying to invest in opportunities where they can keep their patients outside the hospital for these 30 days. And beyond that, what's interesting uh, is that even if we have these 1,000 patients, the same patients need the service afterwards to, to, to keep the, the adherence pump, to keep the snagging going on. Yeah. So we already have these within the hospital, and we can still charge insurance companies afterwards. Cost analysis for the development. Well, we're currently uh, using a platform called Twilio for uh, the SMS. Um, each SMS costs us less than uh, 50 cents. Um, uh, actually, half a cent, uh, not 50 cents, half a cent. It's yeah, not the difference. Um, our, our costs are basically the uh, development itself, um, uh, the, the, the team salaries, and uh, the office which we want to operate from. So we're looking at a $200,000 investment, and uh, we believe that will take us through the next three years.
All right. Thank you. Okay. Next speech is going to be semi marketing, and I'm going to ask to Luca to be prepared for the next speech. I want to start first by telling you a little story. Once upon a time when I was in college, I was a bachelor in marketing and in my last year I had to, had to do uh, this um, social service project. So I went to this place called Fundacion Mi Conmigo and I started, I needed to apply my marketing skills there. Uh, what I realized when I started working there were uh, these things. One, they had a very unclear definition on the market. So what Fundacion Ben Conmigo did was uh, they helped disabled <coughs> children uh, to, well, they, to facilitate them with um, uh, wheelchairs and education and all of this. So, but they, they tried to get donations uh, from people that weren't sure that were giving them money. Uh, people didn't know them. They had no marketing strategy whatsoever, so um, they didn't have something established. They just like move along, and the money that they allocated in marketing activities, like for example, they printed a thousand uh, flyers that they didn't even give out, or they paid for like this radio station uh, commercial, but in a place that was mi misplaced. So, well, what we what I realized is that they had all these problems. And finally, I realized that with my expertise, I could change it, I could apply marketing as it's done in business, and I could help them move on. So, uh, we had the best idea ever, <laughs> which, which was savvy marketing. So, uh, what we do is we help social enterprises develop a marketing journey uh, to reach uh, their social and financial, financial goals through lean marketing and design thinking principles. What is the marketing journey for us? It's everything from the assessment on how the company is doing until the measure and report. So we want to help them go to the state where they initially are, to the positioning of their uh, of their company, their strategy, the define their marketing, actually like make their campaign happen, and finally measure and report where they're doing. But we don't want to do this like a linear process. So we are a cons consultancy, which is a mix mixture between consulting and an agency. What we want to do is we take uh, the first assessment, we start testing in little markets and seeing little act activities. So we don't have to put like all the money in one advertising campaign or all the money in printing all this material. So we start testing activities and see how the market reacts to them. And then it becomes um, a process, like a cyclical process, in which we spend little resources to find out which is the best marketing strategy. And once we find it, we define, launch, and scale that that strategy for the social enterprises. What are the outcomes? Well, we are aiming to eliminate waste, unnecessary activities, and uh, minimize the efforts that they they have. Better allocation of their resources, so the resources that they use already for marketing, put them somewhere that will help, <coughs> and lower the costs, uh, increasing the return on, on marketing investment, and being more cost effective. Our impact, what, what we are trying to do is, well, save the world, how? By increasing the uh, social return on marketing investment for every client. What does this mean? That whatever they're investing in their marketing strategy should help these social enterprises to get more impact out there and to get uh, their social uh, objective uh, make it make it real. How are going are we going to make it? Well, part of our value proposition is our team. So our squad is composed by me. I'm a marketing specialist, social entrepreneur. I know strategy and project man management. Hilda, which will develop uh, the business. She's an uh, expert in PR and networking. And Isabel, who is an uh, expert in finance and consulting. 
uh, how is our model? Well, uh, <laughs> we are trying first, we are uh, going to charge for consulting hours and testing. Uh, we are thinking about a base fee, then uh, the production and implementation of the actual campaign. So we can go to and give them the marketing strategy or implement the whole thing and we'll let them uh, decide if they want to do it or they want us to do it. And we want to thank also uh, our A team, which, which is our advisor board. Uh, is Alison C uh, Caesar, Alexa, who is here, our mentor, and Anisha. Thank you very much. Um, for many years of trying to consult to people that need services like small and medium businesses, I find that many people need your help, but it's hard for them to realize it and even harder to get them to pay you for it. So how would you um, approach selling these services that are needed for social businesses? Uh, how would you get them to actually pay you guys money uh, for consulting? Well, what we've seen, we've actually been doing individual interviews for people. So Pulse, who was the old prize oh. person the last year, actually came to us. We told them they're again, they're like, yes, this is what we do. We don't know how to do Twitter. We don't know what we need to kind of get to our target market. We also spoke to somebody from Plum Organics who focused on sustainability, and they're huge. They're owned by Campbell's. They don't, they don't have someone who's mission aligned, which is one of our vision. Our kind of um, value proposition is that we are social entrepreneurs, and we're at, we know what you want based on dependent on the project. After speaking to these people, we know that there's a market. I strongly believe that it's here specifically in social entrepreneurship that's growing insane. In 2012, $500 billion was created just from social enterprises in the United States, and it created 10 million jobs. And we're confident that we can reach out to these social enterprises through our network, through our expertise, that they would believe in us enough to start with the base fee that we are going to offer, which is going to be more affordable, let's say, as compared to an intern or someone that they can hire in-house to kind of get their marketing set or marketing goals reach. So on the uh, Pulse and the Campbell affiliated group, they both said they wanted, they had a need and they're willing to pay you. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, it sounds like uh, from me, <laughs> S-R-O-M-I. Yeah. It, it sounds like that's something measurable. Yes. And it sounds like if you can measure before and after state, that would be some kind of quantifiable way of delivering value or marketing. To have some initial feedback would be kind of good to have those customers like we did this for so and so mm -hmm. and game, such and such. Uh, but I think that the you know, I think the question becomes like how do you actually what are the tangible financial points like that you drive down my cost per like? Did you give me how many views per dollar? Well yeah. I think it depends a lot on the marketing it like every consulting or agency it is very um, enterprise specific so what you charge them it's different and probably what you measure for each one of them would be different so I think in every case we would have to develop the metrics that that we will give and at some point they would standardize because they can be replicable but in the starting stage we would need to understand exactly what the enterprise needs uh, what's their stage in that moment and how we can measure the difference between the starting point and the so to clarify then, you would help them, help educate them what their cost per like is, or exactly. much yes, of course. Per mm -hmm. Have you thought of a sort of a premium model, that there is some basic, basic things that I can do in the platform, just to get me cool? Because I'm following Larry's question. For a small and medium enterprise, it's hard to say, I'm going to pay you $10,000, because it's hard to, to see the impact, the, you know, the benefit that I'm going to be on. Well, the premium model we did play around with. Um, from what we've seen, again, people said that they were interested to pay a base fee of a certain amount, and they do have, from their initial seed investments and even just people giving them, they have these funds, they just don't have the expertise to roll them out, which is what they would be paying for more. We believe that premium is useful, but we're strong enough in our belief that we can charge them and that it will, will work. And of course, that's also from piloting. We'll see what, what works for us, what our capability is, who we can partner up with, would it be corp big corporations out there, who's gonna give us that expertise that they're willing to leverage as well. Um, and what we were thinking was a flat rate of $800 a month. 
which is similar to something that she's actually working on now getting working with a social enterprise just as an intern so if they're willing to work on something with an intern who has that kind of expertise we think for a full team they might be willing to be a minimum of that. One more minute question. I want to echo the SR uh, social return investment piece. Uh, that's that's a very challenging piece, the whole impact measurement, and nobody has it figured out. So if you could have an easy way to measure those in the context of marketing and message reaching the intended target, that's something that's tangible and something hard to do. And it's something like the Campbells would know they don't. That's not their business, and they'd be willing to pay people with expertise in something more narrow than commercial um, return on investment or social return on investment. So I think there might be something there to exploit. We thought about including uh, Iris metrics and cheers in yeah. our reports. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now it's the turn of Muka. And I'm going to ask Ravi to get prepared. of the world's poor. That's 400 million. 400 million skilled craftsmen making beautiful handmade products, living in extreme poverty with less than a dollar a day. Due to lack of access to formal education and technology, along with the extreme barriers they must overcome, they are not able to showcase their skills to the global market. Instead, they are either running out of business, exploited, or referred to just as cheap labor. The eternal question is how to save this priceless heritage and retain the dignity and grace of the lives of the artists who are continuing. In fact, the universal challenge is how to keep the beauty and purity of our heritage without exploitation. I am Katie. I am Arezzo. I am Mouse. Founders, Founders of MUCA. And this is exactly the issue we want to solve. Instead of this, we want to totally eliminate the barriers. Giving craftsmen a direct access to the global market. How? By building a community. A community of craftsmen. Craftsmen who want to better their lives and their families. Designers. Designers who want a wider exposure for their art. Customers. Customers who want affordable, high quality, handmade products that tell a story and serve a, so a larger social purpose. Now let us take you through the MUCA experience. Meet Ita. Ita is part of our partner Tivoli tribe located in South Cotabato in the southernmost region of the Philippines. He is skilled in weaving sustainable materials such as abaca and rattan. And recently his wife just gave birth to their fifth child. So he has to make more money to sustain his growing family. Now let's meet Sarah. Sarah is a um, passionate freelance designer who helps MUCA keep up with the latest market trends. She submits her design on the website, which viewers can vote on, and um, winning entries will be passed on for production. <coughs> now, let's go back to San Francisco and meet our customer, Jane. 
Jane is in her early 30s and settling into a new home. She is she used to buy stuff from IKEA but now wants more home pieces that she feels a personal connection She first hears about Muka through social media. She goes on the Muka website and what she sees are not just products but faces. Profiles of the craftsmen and their communities, creating beautiful works of art, as well as designers who want to contribute their vision. Beyond this, she immerses herself to the um, rich heritage and diverse cultures of these craftsmen via community development, such as report. Um, we will be showcasing reports. We will have videos. We will have. Um, photos that show our community development in which we uh, do business education um, in training and workshops. Mooka's e-commerce platform bridges the gap. It allows craftsmen to sell their products, share their culture, and tell their stories. Imagine this. There are more than 5,000 groups of indigenous peoples living in over 70 countries. Global home furnishing industry is expected to reach $700 billion by 2050. The potential to scale impact is massive. We believe in products that tell a story. We believe in the power of human connection. We believe they are worthy of a face. What do you believe? We, we are, are MUCA. I believe I'd like to see an income statement. <laughs> <laughs> Next edition in the workshop. <laughs> yeah, we understand that the whole logistics of this will be difficult, but we're actually in the process of conducting a pilot. And since we're all not experienced in this area, we want to learn through the pilot to, to see the breakdown of costs as well as, I guess, learn the whole logistics. Actually, this is where it all starts. Next week, we will be going home to the Philippines. We actually ordered products already that will start our pilot. And we are um, consulting with different um, entrepreneurs in the Philippines who actually get to ship abroad, like worldwide, their products. So from there, we will learn where from where to go and apply a lean startup method. Do you think you can get by to some business from the Philippines to start? Will that be enough of a core business for you to handle the volume you need to produce to, to make to stay in business? In the Philippines. Yeah, there are hundreds of, um, are you asking about the customers? Or customers? customers. Just is there enough business so volume? The business volume for you, uh, people producing enough goods? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, actually, Philippines is the second largest producer of handicraft. And we have over 100 um, indigenous tribes in the Philippines alone. And um, in fact, like the other international brands, they get um, <laughs> their products from the Philippines and they sell it at a bigger price uh, internationally. Okay. For example, is the Don Island. They have the um, manufacturing uh, warehouse in the Philippines. So that second bubble is the designer who came up with that kind of closed uh, so far, whatever. Who's going to do that? Are you thinking that we would have kind of fresh modern designs that you bring back to the craftsman yes. in the Philippines? So who is that? Who, where's your community? Um, for that, we wanted to initially start partnering with design schools so we can hold design school competitions where um, students that are about to graduate can submit designs and then it can be voted on. That's, that's what we were thinking as well. I think the challenge that you're going to face is in the connection between the design and the craft person and the fact that he can produce on quality and on time because if I order something I want to arrive within a certain window and with an expected quality. How are you trying to, to fulfill those promises? Yeah, we were thinking for the beginning we'll have a sort of inventory and then there's also, there would be an avenue if customers would want a more customized piece, well, they'll understand that it takes a longer lead time for those type of products. But for, yeah, those that want to buy off the bat, we'll have an inventory. 
And um, of course, with the designers, we wouldn't let we would know what kind of materials the indigenous communities, our partner indigenous communities, would be using. So when we hold competitions or we have like an online submission, we they have to have that limitation of that kind of um, material. Have you looked at other uh, competitors in this area? Because this is a yeah. very rich area of experimentation. We've seen a few competitors, but the difference that we've seen with all is that they go to developing countries, but not really target indigenous communities. So that's the difference we have from them. And aside from that, um, the videos and photos, that will be our mode of transparency. It's not just to introduce who the makers are, but it's our mode of transparency transparency to show where the customer's money goes. The thing is they have a lot of skills. They, they, these skills have been passed on to from generations to generations and they're not be, uh, able to connect to the global market because they have no access. That's why we as MUCA will give them that access to actually sell their products and tell their stories. I think that I got Carlos's uh, concern about taking a design prototype and making sure it turns into a finished manufactured piece. There might be some quality differences between one indigenous creator of it versus another. Uh, so that would be one concern that I uh, wanted to echo. Secondly, are you going to actually provide also the buying marketplace? Is that understand correctly? So you're going to really do the entire ecosystem or are you going to maybe feed into another service like say Etsy or some other place where people are searching for people? This is the marketplace. We're providing the marketplace. So then, um, so you have to handle shipping and, and all those issues too. That's a big, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. As of now, we're going to pilot with Amazon Warehouse. They have a warehouse in Manila and we'll start from there. And actually with the products, uh, we will be going to Manila and the community next week to be able to like see what actually, what, and actually touch what they have. All right. So we have three more teams. So next is going to be Ravi. And I'm going to ask you any more words to get ready.
have this opportunity to stand here along with my team and present Robbie, a social enterprise which offers you a new way to buy customized Persian, Persian carpet. But let me tell you a story where my passion comes from. Since I was 15, I can remember my parents showing a lot of passion for Persian carpets, treasuring them as a magnificent work of art and a cultural heritage, teaching me about the practice of this uh, craft in many parts of Iran, and more specifically about Fars, my province. I heard a lot about unique designs, many colors, and how expensive they are, but I never heard about her and children and women that they are waving these carpets and that my parents talked so high about. Persian carpets are hand-woven products ranging between $500 to $150,000 in various sizes. What most people don't realize is that the people who are making these carpets are women and children in the rural villages of Iran. And they are forced to work eight to 10 hours per day with a little compensation and uh, as little as $100 per month with no recognition, which is usually taken with them from them by multiple middlemen. And above all, they are suffering from serious respiratory illnesses. Robbie offers a new way to buy Persian rugs, customized Persian rugs, through an online webpage telling the stories behind each carpet as they are made, using the storybook to share the experience with the buyer. We are reducing the number of the middlemen and just working with only one representative in the field. Robbie benefits waivers by increasing the monthly wage to an international standard average uh, wage rate, improving their working conditions, and above all, giving them a chance not to use their children as a secondary source of income. And secondly, it offers buyers an opportunity to know where the, these rocks come from, who made them, and an access to the fair trade Persian carpet. And finally, Ravi offers uh, this opportunity to Iranian community to grasp the idea and the concept of the social entrepreneurship, which is not often practiced. Let me walk you through our business model. Rami website provides uh, buyers with the uh, designs, the different designs, with different colors and different sizes. So, you as a buyer, you can go to the website, choose a design, and customize your rocks. The website will automatically tell you if the, we have the rocks available or not. If the rocks are available, you can place an order and run a representative in the field will receive the money and take the carpet from the waiver and ship it to the buyer. And I like to emphasize that we will make sure that no child has been used to waive those carpets. And in case if the carpets are not ready, again, the website will tell them that, for example, this carpet needs six months to be ready or three months to be ready, and if the buyer is willing to wait, they can pay two-thirds of the price and place an order, and the same procedure will go on. Our revenue and cost model is uh, pretty simple, but it's very extensive because we use uh, different parameters, but generally is the payments for customized rugs, and the cost breakdown is the raw material used, shipping, tax and tariffs on the carpets, salaries we are paying, and marketing and insurance. The product pro uh, pricing parameters that we are using and making, uh, taking into account is the designs, sizes, raw materials, and the density of the knots per square meter. Where we start? Um, actually, we were struggling which province of Iran we have to uh, target and uh, use, um, help the waivers of that province. We, we made a lot of interviews, and uh, finally, we, uh, we talked with the head of Nomad Rock. Uh, he was he shared with us uh, the more than 20 years of his experience in fair trade carpets in India and Afghanistan, and uh, he talked about the Persian carpets coming from the province of uh, Fars, from the Turkish tribe of Kashgai, which is highly demanded in an international market. And we we decided since we are from the region and we already have the trust-based relationship with the many uh, waivers in the tribe we can use it as our competitive advantage and start from the region. Again, we went out, we did a lot of interviews with the export companies and uh, that they are existed in the international level. And uh, there are three of them that they are willing to help us to export. And through them, we got a secondary uh, data that they mentioned that uh, Europe 
uh, specifically Germany and uh, Switzerland are, are the, the best market to target and we're gonna start from the, those two countries. You have sorted out all the export and currency movement. I mean, I hear that Iran is a fairly close economy, that it has some limitation in terms of. That is exactly what strikes me to do this, because Iran has been, um, many people in Iran has been struggling because of the sanction on Iran, and it's politically isolated, and so not a lot of social entrepreneurship is being uh, practiced there. And we wanted to be the change agent here. And uh, for the Sanford, for the US, we cannot uh, do business here for now till the end of 2014 because there is an embargo and a sanction going on. But uh, after the sanction, they are promised that the sanction on the carpet export will be uh, lead, left, lifted by 2014. Uh, for now, we are targeting Europe because Europe is importing 40% of the export of Iran. and in, uh, export of the Persian carpet are second second industry that benefit the country after the oil. Mm. When, when you mentioned fair trade carpets being done, I guess in Afghanistan, is that the business model you're using, whatever? What, what I'm thinking is there are competitors, there are middlemen already that are not going to stand still for you taking their business away. Are you going to use a business model somebody else has developed to, to show how that can be done? Yes, actually we, we um, we talked with the Nomad company, the Nomad uh, Rock Company here in San Francisco, and uh, uh, he has an experience. The head of the company he has experience, more than 20 years experience in the fair trade of uh, carpets in from Afghanistan and India, and uh, when and he was really interested in the uh, Kashgai tribe, this uh, uh, Turkish tribe of uh, Fars province. But since this uh, people are poor and they are very risk averse and they don't easily trust and uh, to work with the strangers. Right. So we offered him the competitive advantage that we have been from the region and already we have established uh, the, the, the relationship with them. So he was really actually very tr uh, interested to work with us and share his experience from the fair trade that he uh, practices that he had in the past 20 years and we give him the competitive advantage of being from the region and our a relationship with them and me as a possible partner. Would customers be willing to buy um, something that may be expensive, uh, something that you don't really want to touch and look at in person? Or are they willing to buy this online? I mean, it just seems like something that typically you want to see in person before you, you buy. Well, at the beginning, we were thinking like um, uh, to have agents, like which is us, to, for example, you're from San Francisco, you place an order, and we have our booklet designs and the material that you can touch and see. And we will have uh, 30 minutes of coffee break with you in a cafe, and uh, because we see that you made an order, and we talk with you, and uh, we show you the design, you can like touch it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we can see a lot of practices that there are already many carpets are sold online and uh, so we don't see it as an issue. And would, would the price uh, difference be very large? I mean, if someone buy it online, cutting out all these middlemen, yeah, do you pass on a lot of savings that way? A lot of margin will be saved for the waivers. Because what we are trying to do is that we don't want uh, waivers to use their saving to buy the raw materials to make it. So what's happening in Iran right now that they are using their saving, buying the raw materials, wools or silk, and they take the risk and they uh, they make the carpet and the middleman comes and take it and they, two, three middlemen and the markup goes up. But that waiver does not take anything. And uh, like $100 per month. And uh, so what we are trying to do is to reduce the middleman we, we are not overclaiming that we are going to eliminate it at the beginning. No, we cannot eliminate it at the beginning, but we can put our own trusted representative there. And uh, we we can increase the margin so they can have the fair wage, and through that they can improve their conditions, and more importantly, they can, the children they don't need to work. We have the last question. Is there a group of value on your margin, like a, a percentage? Pardon? On your margin, what percentage, what, what, what margin size do you have? Well, we are trying to increase the margin by 10%, 10-15% for the papers. And who's in charge of the risk analysis? 
who's been working on this since you well, were at Barnes? Actually, uh, my brother currently in Iran, he, he's a financer and he has his own company, so he's very experienced in the business and he has a, a very close relationship with this tribe because he's working with them. And So now we have animal work, and then the last presenter is going to be Cherish. Since I was a child, I've been always passionate about animals. At that time, what I used to do is feed my house with all kinds of animal species and drive my parents crazy. Now that I grow up, I understand that if I want to help animals, what I have to do is help them in their environment. However, I'm not a biologist. And just like me, there is many, many people who share the same passion. But except for donating, protecting, protecting the environment, and be a responsible consumer, where there is not much that we can do at the global level. On the other side, also biologists and zoologists face the issues. Uh, global extinction rate is now higher than ever before. Uh, zoologists and biologists strive to get more observation and to have a quick and reliable uh, peer review identification system of this species observation. That's because this allows them to monitor the evolution of species and maybe prevent the risk of extinction rather than act when the damage is already done. Uh, what we want to do is connect the, eye, uh, the eyes of the animal lovers with the experience uh, of the biologists and zoologists. How are we going to do that? Animal World is a mobile app that enables users to upload pictures of the wildlife, uh, discover new species, and explore other observation. We are providing a gamification process. It helps users post pictures to identify their species, and also for us to filter only relevant data. Uh, this data, when the picture is uploaded, comes with geographical information. Geographical information is very helpful, helpful for carrying on conservation programs. So, for example, if we think of the IUCN, is the biggest entity who carries on uh, conservation programs. They aim to double the number of observation classification they have by 2020, and they still have a long way to we will provide them this data. Uh, more in detail, how it works. These are images from our prototype. The first step is the picture, is when the picture is taken and it's uploaded, uh, the picture comes with the, uh, with the geographical data attached. Here, the gamification uh, starts. So, uh, every user who has experience can actually uh, identify, confirm, or suggest another species if the tag and the name is actually correct. <coughs> uh, users get the rank, and the more activity they have, they, the more they can expert and they also uh, can be specialized for some specific species or geographical area. Uh, when these data are confirmed by our expert user, well, people can explore the species that have been uploaded and also comment, interact, and reach out to the, to the people who has provided this image. Uh, we know that there are something like 10,000 new species discovered every year, so we hope that we can have discovered some of this. So at this point, we, you might be wondering how we're going to make money. And that's <laughs> <laughs> a very good point. So we believe we are in a preliminary stage. And uh, we believe that until we build the community, it will be quite hard for us to validate our new models. But we got some ideas. The first one is to provide uh, enough purchase of interactive content. This is an example of an app that's been very successful. They provide this profile of any animals, and they are actually interactive, so you can see where they live, access the description, uh, access to really uh, nice videos, or you can, you can also integrate this, for example, with your an interactive evolutionary history, so you can see basically how the species evolved and what are the related ones. 
Another idea is uh, a quick identification process. So let's see that I, I spot an animal, I want to see what it is. I can pay one dollar and there is a professional reviewer who get 50 cents, 20 cents to the National Conservation Program and 25 cents to us. Uh, about the competitive landscape, there are some app who have already tried to develop such a system. Uh, they achieved a really good, good response in terms of user activity and picture updating. But the feed feature doesn't really work because they use a geographical map where all the data gets superposed. Nobody can actually go and review that. And so this stops gamification. We believe we can do it better. And as you've seen, this is more our app is more like an Instagram. So it's very easy to scroll and get access to the data. Uh, our team, there is me, uh, our team of animal lovers, there is me experiencing finance. Joao is our uh institute engineer. Uh, Mari is experienced in biochemistry uh, and natural science. She will provide the as a pass with uh, research and publication. And finally, uh, Duarte is going to help us in mind. So, thank you. So, this looks like one that's based on love of animals and wanting to support the conservation efforts, right? That's instead of that talking, you're trying to create a vehicle for people to, to learn more and discover and from that. Exactly. Yeah. Our value proposition is for normal user. Actually, they're not biologists, but a way to support and empower them to do, to do this. Mm -hmm. And the conservation efforts. And the content would come from the community, it looks like mostly, rather than yes. your own photographers and biologists. Uh, well, uh, we're gonna we're gonna want to take both of them. Okay. So they will have a different uh, system where they can upload their content, and also they will be like the main. At the beginning, it will be the expert who will start the review process. So how would you reach these animal lovers to let them know about you and create traffic to your site and your app? Okay, uh, so uh, our idea to like to go to the market, we believe that the first uh, uh, segment we have to target is the experts, so biologists and zoologists, because they they are the one who provide us with good content, rather than go and take a kid who can provide a picture of a chicken. Or <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, we have already been talking with them and. Uh, know how they already work and implement this very new system which is very important for them. Uh, our idea is like to take a, uh, to contact somebody and um, give them the possibility of inviting some other peers to join the system. This way everybody can invite a peer and everybody will get an expert. We don't know all the experts around us but from connection to connection this might be reached and very quickly another thing that works for them is that when there is a, a, a zoologist which is experiencing in one species, he doesn't have a comprehensive knowledge. So they already reach out to uh, colleagues in the same area to have support and identification. So I understand. One of, the, one of the easiest ways to build brand is to borrow somebody else's brand. And that's what you're doing. You're borrowing the brand of established zoologists. That makes sense. Would you consider um, allowing people to import photos? From Google Plus or Flickr or something like that, maybe have a uh, tagging algorithm to beef up the library to start with? So the idea is that uh, when a user starts using for the first time and doesn't have an error rank, no, he has to upload them with the app because we need the geographical information. If the user has an error rank and has some credibility, and for example, is also uh, signed in with his LinkedIn profile, so we actually know who he is, we can have possibility for him to provide the picture and also the geographical information. And that's because, for example, there are professional photographers or professional zoologists who maybe should be joined with a professional camera to do like because they cannot put the get close to the line and the line. So they will have this possibility. But standard user and uh, responsive user no because they can provide some fake content. Okay. Uh, one of the challenges you have to gain traction and I was thinking that maybe if you narrow, instead of dealing with all animals, just with birds, for example, bird watchers, okay. and you cater to that community. Actually, that's what we are trying to do. We already reached out to the Alcohol Society, where they have this Christmas bird count, and every year they spot all the animals passing from uh, in the United States. Um, 
However, they use a different system. Uh, maybe for them it's not very easy to spot us with the mobile, so we are trying to focus more on some other branches of uh, whether it is, uh, we are having some discussion with that. But yes, we're going to start with that on a small range rather than go and take a look at that. In some ways, this sounds a little bit like a user-generated content site with users and the zoologist. Those specifically function the best when there's a clear value to users uploading and creating the content. So with that premise, I would say um, I would like to see perhaps more focus on I am a zoologist with the benefit from me from contributing into your system. Am I getting uh, feedback from the community where I can then go to my grants and say, I've got this beneficial quality of research or in some way adding to what my work is right like in? Uh, I would like very quickly to share a, a story I presented to you, which there is an initiologist, these are the people who study fish. Uh, he knew about uh, the project of building a dive in Guyana, in, in, in Latin America, in French Guyana. So uh, before actually uh, allowing the government, they want to do a survey about all the animal species. He went there and take two pictures of all the fish in two spot. He went back home and uploaded them on Facebook and just tagged all of his friends who are each other too. He went to sleep and next morning all these fishes were identified by his friend and he didn't have a comprehensive knowledge because many of them when he went to the school. That's the value for them. And also, for example, I have a direct contact. So if I study the polar bear in the Arctic and there is somebody and that should be your lead off anecdote. Yeah, yeah, that's good. good. All right. <laughs> and our last presenters, Cherish. by asking how many people like soda. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> but teacher, are sodas really healthy? You're right, Diana. Sodas are not healthy. Except of Cherish. Cherish is a nutritious, bubbling drink that is made of natural, organic fruits and vegetables that are using natural sweeteners as well. So let's talk about a little bit about the problem. Soda, excessive soda consumption is, has contributed to one of the largest healthcare problems in the US and in the world. So actually, 70% of American adults are overweight. And almost four out of 10 people are obese. And the worst part of it is that 93% are most likely to get diabetes because of this. This is terrible. But how can we break this trend? Well, how can we do it if everywhere we go, we find drinks, we find drinks that are not healthy at all. Well, the industry has developed some alternatives that claim to be healthy, but they're not at all. Let's think of sodas, uh, of diet sodas, of vitamin water, of juice, uh, of packet juices. They're either using artificial sweeteners or they have tons of sugar. So this is not good. And let's talk about Steve. Steve is a young professional. He has middle income. Uh, he's between 24 and 90, 49 uh, years old. And he's a hard worker. And he wants to become successful. He's you know, um, uh, well educated and he's working hard every day. Now there are 65 million people like Steve that don't have enough time to take care of the dreams that they have, that they're really healthy. And we want to help them. Cherish wants to help people like Steve to have access to nutritious bubbling drinks to quench their thirst, but also to make them feel better every day. And we do it with a drink that has an immediate positive effect in their body by balancing their sugar levels and their blood pressure. Um, and our blend is made of organic fruits, vegetables, and natural sweeteners, as we mentioned. And we are not yet in the market, but <coughs> our initial tests or our initial drinks um, are already, or people have already said they like it. So this is amazing news for us. Now, how can we claim that our drink actually does this? That it has this power of balancing blood sugar and, 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 and blood pressure? Uh, well, there's 30 years of scientific research and publications out there that, are, that have proven the, the benefits of the fruits and vegetables that we're going to use. 
And this is an example of, an, of, of the results of the test. If we can see that they use um, they, they use control group and they use diabetic uh, diabetic group where they were drinking these vegetables and fruits and you can see this is their sugar levels and they reduced after drinking it almost to normal levels so this is amazing and we want to take advantage of it in order to do so sorry um, we want to invest a little bit more on research and development in order to come up with the best drink and the best meat uh, blend that has this power that is really what our consumers are looking for. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to make up our, our market validation strategy in four stages. First, we want to come up with a uh, digital campaign where we can, we're targeting our first potential customers. And then we're going to produce our first uh, wave of product that it has a blend of, product, uh, of vegetables and fruits that we mentioned earlier. Um, after we iterate and come up with the feedback from our consumers, we're going to go and uh, go outside of market segment to look at you know, people with diabetes, people with kids, so that we can provide the highest quality product for them that is safest and that is, um, uh, has all the benefits that we mentioned earlier. And at the end, we're going to invest in the ground development so that we can go to market. Now, Diana is going to talk to you about the business model. So one of the biggest challenges that we see in entering this market is distribution. That's why we cherish all this problem by <coughs> omitting those regular distribution channels and going to directly to people's workplace and selling our products to vending machine and to their homes through online purchases. And we believe that if we can do that, that we can actually reach our target industry, which already shows a great annual growth and is projected to grow even more due to health concerns. And we believe that we can do that because our team is very powerful and we will prove that. <laughs> so here we are, Team Cherish. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we were working together since the previous year. We start to work together on the whole price competition. But because we enjoy so much to work together and we strongly believe in our ideas, we decided to continue. You already met Gidje, she is responsible for our business development. And my name is Ivaivo. Uh, I'm project manager and this is what I was doing in the past 10 years. Mushan is responsible for research and development, actually his PhD in chemistry. And Diana, you know her, maybe the only MP still in the competition. She is responsible for the finance. And Rao is responsible for marketing. As you can see, we have very, very diverse team. And actually we are speaking every major language in the world. <laughs> yes. So this uh, drink is based on uh, some research that, uh, so is this research proprietary or if there's some magic, you know, fountain of youth type of thing going on, why has no one else done this? No, there are a lot of uh, the data is there in the market, but people have done the, the research on individual ingredients. There are certain data on some, some blend, but no one has targeted like uh, coming up with a new soda. Like there are a lot of juices, a lot of uh, healthy teas, and a lot of things are there in the market. <coughs> but our uh, product is like uh, we are targeting soda industry. And there we are uh, making the, from the, not from the chemical, but from the organic food. So that's the uh, main idea we have. So that the, the magic thing has no real taste. So you, you, you're putting that in context of fruit and other yeah. healthy things, but it's fizzy as a soft drink. Yeah, we already work on like a couple of formulations here. Yeah. Do you have some here? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you can ask some of the people which already tried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I have a recommendation more than I have a, a question. You guys have a very strong background for this kind of business. That should have been your first slide. You should have said, we know this business, we've got some credibility, and we're going to tell you about a problem we've found and solved, and then taking me through that. You can just stipulate, yeah, I know, Americans are fat, we're diabetic. Just go right to the answer and tell us, you know, tell, tell us that you've got something that's demonstrably better, and you can do something the competition can't do. And by then, you've got us pounding on the table and say, tell me more, tell me more, and then you show us the answers. Right? So you should have you should have put put the order so that we you know there had to be an income statement somewhere. Right? <laughs> 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 but but I will believe your income statement because you guys have got that kind of background, right? Yep. Okay. Here is Diana. She's doing this like one of my I'll believe it because of four of you. Oh. <laughs> 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 my concern is how 
why should they believe your prophecies? I mean, bomb grenade was a fiasco. The agave that was supposed to be, you know, the second coming didn't fulfill any of the promises, and the list go on. So why should I believe your health promises, and what guarantees do you give me so I try your drink? So yeah, so basically, uh, as I said, uh, we already tried three formulations, three different types of blades, uh, blades of these ingredients. And we, uh, we tested with a couple of people over here, and some person has a diabetic problem. And as soon as he has like just one shot of our drink, his uh, blood sugar level dropped from 180 to 135. So that's the first data we got immediately uh, at the, uh, in our one first formulation. So we are trying to uh, use that data. We are trying to come up with a new formulation that uh, that's a uh, research data, but just to attract uh, people from normal uh, professional, like right, say young professionals or some people, family members, we are trying to come up with a, a good blend of uh, these fruits and vegetables that gives not only the good uh, uh, blood sugar level, uh, uh, that would that would not only uh, uh, take care of the blood sugar, but also takes care of taste, and it will attract uh, the customers again and again. They can start uh, drinking that, or they will need that. If that's the case, then you should go for full transparency and put even the formulation on your website. Okay. So if I want to blend those things at home, I can do it. Now the convenience mm -hmm. is I can buy it already prepared. Sure. And that's of course. But I will go for that. Mm -hmm. And with full transparency and I will you know, have a blog, people can comment, okay. and so forth. In, in the U.S., uh, making health claims is, is heavily regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. And so when you make claims, that's, that's really a very careful thing you have to do in the, to the general public. And so you're crossing into the field that is like, you have nutritious things that you want to make health claims with. So one way to do it is to, I don't know if you want to do it, is to do full bona fide protocol-based <coughs> FDA-type work to prove the merits medically of the promise because otherwise you can't really make the promise other than it tastes good that's right so the, that's one of the reasons we are putting a lot of money in our okay yeah we, yeah we actually yes we consider that because we already um try to estimate the cost of what it would cost us to, to validate them formula so that we would have grounds to say that it is healthy and for example we should Correct me if I'm mistaken, if you want to test a product on same mice, you have to spend like fifty or sixty thousand yeah. dollars. Well we started with people for free. <laughs> so that you no, I understand. Yeah. And, and the right test for blood glucose is is not, I mean for diabetes is a blood glucose, that's a instantaneous test. It's, it's A one C. You want to really show if you can show long term A one C improvement. Okay. Anyway. And also we are also uh, working with the petition. We are trying to connect the petitions from all yeah. the hospitals. Two points. I was a medical rep to doctors and hospitals when I was out of school. I would completely stay. I sold blood pressure medicine. I'd stay out of that. That's like the reasons already said. You're not talking about 200,000. You're talking millions and millions and millions. Just forget it. Go find out for yourself. Second thing is I can introduce you to a health food restaurant chain starting at the end of the month. They would love to hear and test your product. Okay, just uh, uh, our judges, I just want to thank you, Larry, AC, uh, Adam, Carlos, and uh, Jacob, that uh, we go with Rachel in the other room, that we will take 10 minutes. So it's, we have a, a 10 minutes, 15 minutes, let's say, break. And then we will announce the final three and then the, the winner. And right after that, uh, we have some coffee. <laughs> so uh, 10 minutes back, it's 35. Let's see here at 45, okay? Thank you.